there, I would love for you to open your Bibles with me as we get into the word in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. And we'll read the word of God, which is read in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Nehemiah, chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. It says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. Verse 3 says, And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And we'll jump to verse 5. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Verse 6 says, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And towards the end of verse 7 it says, And the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. And we'll finish in verse 8. So they read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly, and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask you. As I was saying earlier, on October the 31st, we know that, well, just here in the United States, uh, cel the celebration of Halloween, and I'm not really going to get into the history of that. Um, I just wanted to mention that we, we don't celebrate the enemy of our Lord, as I read in 1 Corinthians 15, 26. There was a man, a, a pastor, that once said when they asked him about this, his simple words were, what's wrong with you people? But I, I do celebrate on the 31st, and I do remember something important, as I mentioned, as Reformation Day. On this very day, I wanted to share with you on October the 31st in 1517, and the title of this message is Moving the Pulpit Back to the Middle. And you'll say, what in the world is he talking about? Moving the Pulpit Back to the Middle. On the 31st of October in 1517, a German monk, many of you have heard of him, his name is Martin Luther. He nailed what was known as the 95 Thesis on the door of the All Saints Church in this place called Wittenberg, Germany. And the reason behind this was that Martin Luther knew that the church had strayed away from the core principles of the word of God. Now, I want you to listen to that. One of the main reasons was because they had strayed away from the core principles and the fundamentals of the faith. He knew not what we know today. He didn't understand what we know today of what had happened in the year 325. We all know what happened when a group of bishops decided that a creed, or a declaration would represent the church and that the Bible would be placed to the side. But what represents the church today and what should represent the church today is only the scriptures and a divine witness of God in the midst of us as we just had right now. Now these points that Martin Luther nailed onto the door of this church in Wittenberg were intended just to spark a debate among them. It was to stir them to soul searching among his fellow brothers in the church. The 95 Thesis sparked much more than a debate as you and I know today. The 95 Thesis revealed that the church was far beyond rehabilitation. She had come to a point that was terrible. You couldn't see the glory that we once saw when Paul preached the word in his time. It was in need of a great Reformation, the church, the world would never be the same after this. You see, in the place where he nailed those theses or these points into that wall was known as social media back in those days. 
Because on that door, the people would gather and they would see what's going on around the city. And you would know what was going on. And Martin Luther decided to nail these things so that the world would see, not knowing that as he began to nail and he's left, some of his students saw what he was doing and went and grabbed it and began to share what he was publishing without him thinking. Now, I'm not going to get too much into the history of what sparked the Reformation, but I want to say a little bit of what it meant or what did we get from the Protestant Reformation. We know that many lives were killed for the gospel of Jesus Christ during this Reformation and beyond the Reformation. The many Bible translations we have today. How many of you have your Bibles? Lift your Bibles up. How many of you have an English Bible? Leave it up. Okay, put it down. How many of you have a Spanish Bible? One person? <laughs> the many Bible translations we have today in the various languages were a direct result from many men and women that gave their lives for you and I to have the ability to read God's Word today in our own language. Just five years after Martin Luther nailed these 95 theses on the wall of the church in Germany, he published the New Testament in the German language. And you know how great of an impact this was? That the German language was barely beginning to form itself. And today we can say that because of the German New Testament and the German Bible, the German language now has an official structure. Because as he began to translate the New Testament in the Bible, common people began to read the Word of God in their common German language, and that formed what is called the linguistics of German language today. So in other words, the Bible is behind the formation of the German language and of the many languages today. All because of this man. Now, what about these 95 theses? Out of all those 95, only two of them speak about the Bible. His whole point was not really to reform the whole Catholic or universal church. He just wanted to spark some debate. And in, ver in, in number 62, it states, The true treasure of the church is the most holy gospel of the glory and grace of God. How many of you agree with that? But then he says in number 63, but this treasure is naturally most hated. This right here. Don't you see the comparison of 2022? <laughs> Don't you think this is the most hated thing today? First, he says in 62, the true treasure of the church is the most holy gospel of the glory and grace of God. Then he says, but this treasure is naturally most hated. For it makes the first to be last. Hmm? The other points from the 95 Thesis pointed out how traditions had taken over the church. And had caused the people to stray away from the true meaning and preaching and teaching of the word of God. Look at the dangers that he was trying to point out. Today we know this to be true. Because it had taken place hundreds of years before, as mentioned, in the Council of Nicaea. When the church decided that they would be represented by a man-made creed. And though it had the word of God in it, the problem was that the word of God was placed to the side. The Bible. And this creed was then lifted up and they said, well, this creed will represent us. And the Bible placed to the side. But what are we trying to do today is bring back the Bible to be lifted up in all things. What Martin Luther was dealing with and others was the results. And I want you to listen to this. What happens when the church lays aside the word of God and picks up traditions and places them in the same authoritative aspects that only the word of God has. Very important. What was the driving force behind these men? It was that the scriptures were sufficient for 
us. What must be the driving force today for the church of God? That the scriptures are sufficient for us in all things. What did this mean? That the Bible was and should be our supreme authority in all spiritual matters. In everything we do, it must be the Bible alone. I shared yesterday in the men's conference in a great theological debate that they had between Martin Luther and all these theologians. They asked him to go up and his, it, was, it was his turn to go up to the pulpit to bring about his debate. And he said, I want Bible. And they said, well, what's your debate? I want Bible. What's your debate? Give me the Bible. And then he got down and left. And that was his whole debate was give me the Bible. They knew that there was a sufficiency, a supremacy in the authoritative scriptures of the word of God. What these men had not yet understood was that years before them, a man by the name of Peter, better known to us as the Apostle Peter, in his universal letter to the church, said the following in 2 Peter 1.19. Listen to what Peter said. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. But I want you to focus on the words when Peter said, We have a more sure word of prophecy. Listen to what Peter is saying. A more sure word not only meant something that is firm in the way Peter is talking to us, but the root word for the word more sure in Greek is basis, which meant walking on or walking on top of or walking into. So listen to what Peter is saying. Peter is saying that the word of God that we have received through Jesus, not only have we received it, but we have stepped into it and have found that the foundation of the word is firm, unmovable, and unshakable. So when Peter is saying we have a more sure word, Peter is saying, I know what the church needs. And Peter is saying, it is nothing less and nothing more than the word of God. And Peter is saying, why? Because when we step into the word as the church, we're going to find a foundation that is unmovable and unshakable and cannot be removed. The apostles knew this. And this is why they said we have a more sure word. What was the more sure word? Even better than his own personal witness and I account witness of the resurrection of Jesus. Peter is saying, I may have seen Jesus, but I'm here to tell you that maybe I didn't see what I saw, but I know what I read in the fulfillment of the scriptures because this is the more sure word. It's unmovable. It's unshakable. And this is why the reformers and men of old, our pioneers, our forefathers, sought to stick to only the scriptures and nothing else. Amen. Our first general overseer this side of the dark ages, Bishop A.J. Tomlinson, once said, he said, the general assembly can make mistakes because we are just men and women. He said, but the word of God, he used to call it the blessed old book, cannot make mistakes. It is unmovable, unshakable. This is where we stand as the church. And Martin Luther knew this. He knew that they had to go back to the scriptures in all of this. This is why the reformers said scripture alone was what was needed to get the church back on track. Back to the divine purpose she had been called to. She needed to heed the words of the apostle Peter, which in reality were not the words of Peter. For the scriptures declare unto us concerning the words that are found in the Bible, that the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. No, but it said, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Holy men of God. It was not their words. It was the inspiration of God that was in them, that was leading them to write and say, we have a more sure word. Hallelujah. They knew that's what the church needed. Ain't that what we need today? 
Isn't that what our society needs today? Isn't that what our marriages need today? Isn't that what our children need today? Isn't that what our neighbors need today? Isn't that what the community needs today? Get back to the word. Back to the word of God. Now, so as we continue to read, Peter says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. In simple words, Peter is saying, we have a more sure prophetic word. Not only was Peter giving us assurance of the word of God, but it it was he that was combining the words of the prophets of the Old and New Testaments, which pointed directly to Jesus, directly to him. Peter is saying that the word that we have to stand on, to walk firmly on, is the sure words of Jesus, who is the fulfillment of the writings of the prophets to which he, Peter, had become an eyewitness to. But better than that, Peter is even saying that the word of God is more firm than his own eyewitness. And then he says, you do well that you take heed. So it was this, it was the same thing, the same aspect that the reformers held on to the word of God for in it, they found a firm way of life. In the religious traditions of our times, All they found and all you can find today is a shaky foundation. They found at that time, sadly, that traditions had been placed above the word of God. They found a dead religion. Don't that sound like our time? Huh? They found a leadership that desired for the people to remain spiritually dead and not to be able to discern the times that they were in. All this resulted in the true preaching of the word to become completely lost. The Bible was not being read in their German language, was not being read in English. It was being read in a Latin Roman language that the common people did not even understand the word. So everything the priest said, they went along and did what he said without getting deep into the word of God because there was no word for them to listen to or to read. Now, it was in this same aspect. Now, all of this brought about a reformation and revival. You see, revival was always sparked by the teaching and preaching of the word of God. What is revival? You see, sometimes we make the mistake and we say, oh, we're going to have a three-day revival. No, you're not. Yes, we are. We're having a three-day revival. No, you're not. That's just a meeting with hopes that it can spark a revival. Mm -hmm. A revival is when sinners fall in complete conviction by the Holy Ghost to draw to God for forgiveness of their sins. A revival is when honest-hearted Christians begin to cry out to God for more consecration to him. That is revival. So don't tell me you're having a three-day revival. Just say you're having a three-day meeting with hopes that the revival will spark from that meeting. That's a real revival. Now, revival is to revive something that is dead or is on the brink of dying. Revival has only come when his people, God's people, turn to his word for life, the word of God, the Bible. We have seen this throughout history. Every time there's a great awakening, it has been sparked by holy men and women of God that have taken up the word of God to preach and teach the scriptures and nothing else. All these men in the great awakening in our country. Don't you want another great awakening? What was the thing that sparked the great awakening in our country? Was that they went back to the word. Preaching, teaching only the scriptures. Now let's go a little bit further back from Peter and the apostles. Let's go back to what we were reading. I'm done with the introduction. Now we get into the message. Okay. Nehemiah chapter 8. In the book of Nehemiah, as we read, an event took place. So you see what I'm saying? We were, the, we were with the reformers. We went back to Peter. Now we're going all the way back to the Old Testament. And listen to this. 
In chapter 8, we read about an event that took place towards the end of the building of the walls of Jerusalem. With Nehemiah and men like Ezra. Now we all know that Nehemiah, seeing Jerusalem in shambles, was pricked in his heart by God to see it restored. That was what God put in his heart. Nehemiah had come back to Jerusalem thinking to find it the way he had always heard of it. I imagine that he remembered the stories that his parents had shared with him concerning Jerusalem. And that that was the picture that he had in his mind as he went back to Jerusalem. But as he heard those stories and he saw the condition of the city, of its people, and then coming back and being an eyewitness to such conditions, his heart began to fail him in the sense of wanting to see the city of God and the people restored. And when we read the accounts in the book of Nehemiah from chapter 1 to 8, we have a mindset to think about Nehemiah and Ezra and many others as just wanting to restore the walls of Jerusalem. You see, when we preach it, sometimes say, oh, well, we're just talking about the restoration of the walls of the building. It's much more than that. There's something deeper than just the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. You see, that's what happens to us many times. We think that the situation that we see right in front of us is the whole situation when God is really trying to say, no, look behind the curtains. I'm trying to tell you something else. And Nehemiah, we think about this. We think about the walls of Jerusalem because there were physical walls, but they had a deeper representation of this. Chapter 7, we read that the walls being built and immediately after they're built, what happens? They didn't go have a party. <laughs> didn't celebrate because the walls were built. Look what we did. No. The Bible says that immediately after this in verse 1 of chapter 8 of Nehemiah, and all the people gathered themselves together as one man, meaning there was unity, into the street that was before the water gates, a representation of the water that was about to be poured on their lives through the word and they spake unto Ezra the scribe and they said Ezra bring us the book of the law of Moses no celebration yet they said no 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 bring us the Bible bring us the word of God which the Lord had commanded to Israel something was about to take place in chapter 8 that had never taken place since the Babylonian captivity of the Israelites it was the reading of the word of God in the midst of the people of Israel. We say, wait a minute. Aren't they the people of God? Shouldn't they have already been reading the word of God in public? Shouldn't they have already been one in the scriptures? But it, the history tells us that they hadn't got together since the captivity of Babylon. And they begin to read the word. It was the reading of the word during a time called the Feast of the Tabernacles. You see, the people, instead of celebrating first because they had finished building the walls, they went back to the word of God. That's where they went. The people of Israel and especially its ministers knew that what they had accomplished would not be blessed without the word of God. You see, the whole purpose of this wasn't really the physical walls that had been built or the time they had spent building. No, the whole purpose behind God using Nehemiah to help start the work of rebuilding the walls, the whole purpose of God using Ezra, who had been there years before waiting for Nehemiah, was that God was using this call to call them back to him. That was the whole purpose. God wanted to call them back. When we're going to understand, when are we going to understand that everything that is happening is not about a tabernacle? It's not about a building. It's not about material possessions. It's not about nothing else, but that God is calling us back as his church. And that the only way this will happen in the church of God is when we get our minds and our hearts and our eyes back into the word of God and nothing else. That's what it's all about. Ain't about nothing else. 
You can see everything on the outside and say, oh, I think it's about this and that. No, it's about God calling us back to the word. And like Martin Luther, give me the word and nothing else. Amen. Our eyes fixed back to the word. Nehemiah and Ezra knew that those were only a physical representation, those walls of what God was doing for his people. God was restoring and building up the spiritual walls of the lives of every single Israelite, the desire to go back to the old paths, to the word. God was restoring and building up the spiritual uh, lives of each and every one of them. And these men of God recognized and desired for the spirit of God to direct them. Amen. Didn't it feel good when we were worshiping God today in the morning? I, I love it when you can just feel the, 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 those, I don't know, you just feel it all over your body. <laughs> Make you want to shout. <laughs> you can just feel God's presence. And this is what they're talking about. The first thing they did before celebrating was to get the word of God out and begin to read it to the people. You want change in our country? Get back to the word. <laughs> hmm? I was speaking to somebody about the Museum of the Bible, and they said, well, what are y'all doing? I said, well, in December, we're going to take over Washington. They said, well, what do you mean? We're going to celebrate Christmas right from the beginning of December all the way until the end. And somebody said, well, I just love that you guys are right there about two miles from the White House. But the building ain't got no power. It's the word of God. The word of God is to call us back to him. Charles Spurgeon once said the following. We want again men like Luther. Men like Calvin, men fit to mark eras whose names breathe terror in the enemy's ears. Listen to that. We have dire need of such men in the church today. Whence will they come to us? They are the gifts of Jesus Christ to the church and will come in due time. He has the power to give us a golden age of preachers. And when the good old truth is once more preached by men, listen to this, whose lips are touched as with a live coal from off the altar, this shall be the instrument in the hand of the Spirit for bringing about a great and thorough revival of religion in our land. Amen. Amen. He continues to say, I do not look for any other means of converting men beyond the simple preaching of the gospel and the opening of men's ears to hear it. He said, the moment the church of God shall despise the pulpit, God will despise the church. Oh, God. Listen to what he said. The moment the church of God shall despise the pulpit, God will despise the church. It has been through the ministry of preaching that the Lord has been pleased to revive and bless his churches. Only the word of God. Now. Ezra in verse 2 says that they brought out the law and they began to read to the congregation from the morning until midday. That was about a six-hour reading of the word of God. I don't know if I would have stayed awake. But when the spirit is behind it, it keep you awake. Because it's not the preacher. It's the word penetrating. They read six hours and a half. Can you imagine this? Now, the Bible says that they had a pulpit made out of wood. And where was it? It was in the middle. Hmm? Now, why did we call this message bringing the pulpit back to the middle? You see, after many years during the Reformation, tradition had crept into the church. And they began to say that the Holy Communion or the Mass was the most important aspect and tradition of the church. So they grabbed the pulpit. I'm not going to grab this pulpit. I'm not too strong. But they grabbed this pulpit and they moved it all the way to the side. And then they said, let's put this table in the middle. And then the main focus of the people will be on the man, the priest, who began to do his mass in Latin. People didn't know what he was saying. And sometimes they didn't even know what they were saying. They just said a bunch of gibberish. And they began to do the mass. And what happened? Tradition took over. But one thing that happened during the Reformation was 
that God sparked a love for the Word of God. And as they began to reform the churches, one thing, the first thing the reformers said was, bring the pulpit back to the middle. Remove the table out the way. Remove the traditions out the way. Remove man out of the way and bring us back the pulpit and put it in the middle of the church so that Christ will be exalted through his word. Then they said, the main message of the gospel is Jesus Christ. The main message of the church of God is Jesus Christ and nothing else. It is Jesus. They said, bring back the pulpit to the middle. Now, as the pulpit returned to the middle, the word of God returned and they began to preach. And it was no longer a man gospel. It was Jesus Christ. It is said of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. When he began to pastor his first church in Westminster Chapel in London years ago, he was aware that the church had become a social gospel to many. You know what a social gospel is? We're going to cancel service and we're just going to have a good time. Martin Luther said, every time the church gets together, the word must be preached. Every time. And we ask ourselves, why do we see the condition that we see today? Because the word isn't being preached. My thoughts are being preached. My ideas are being preached. CNN or Fox News is being preached, but not the word. And Martin Luther, I mean, uh, Dr. Jones found out that the local church had become a social gospel. In other words, lots of things were taking place in the stage of the local church. And the first thing he did, and I'm not telling you that Brother Jernigan is going to do this, okay? But the first thing he did, he went to that local church and he said, hmm, he said, look at this pulpit. Give me a hammer. And he grabbed some nails and and he nailed the pulpit to the middle. He said, this church will stand and will fall on the word of God and nothing else. And he began to preach the word. And he said, Dr. Jones, people ain't going to come to your church. And in one year was full of young people. Because. The study of the scriptures had come back. Now, we don't need anything else today but the true preaching of the gospel of Jesus. We don't need a social gospel to take over our local churches. A social gospel, like I said, is when a local church becomes a social gathering place instead of a place where the word is preached. And Ezra began to read in verse 5 and 6, and I'm here in my conclusion. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And in verse 6, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, amen, amen. They must have been Pentecostals. With their lifting up their hands, they said, amen, amen. They felt it. Huh? And they bow their heads and worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. It sparked a revival in the people. The people of Israel recognized at that moment that the walls that they had built could be destroyed again at any moment. But what God was doing in this national revival would last a lifetime. Because it would be brought about by sharing what God had done. It is now the year 20. 22. I remember when we were going through the Y2K. I, was, I think I was 11 years old. So I said, I'm never going to get married. I ain't going to have no kids. The world's going to end. It's already 2022. Hmm? And we're still reading about Ezra today. Amen. The days of humanistic preaching and teaching must be eradicated. The days of presenting a social gospel must be eradicated. We need to get back to the word. Scripture alone and nothing more. I would love you to rise with me in this wonderful morning.